Hey everyone, welcome to this very special episode of Plain Talking UK. Now this is a special that we've been planning for a couple months now. It's a corporate aviation special. Now, we occasionally talk about corporate or business aviation or private aviation. Um, however, it's not as prevalent as our commercial stories, our military stories, and even our just general aviation stories. Now, corporate aviation actually makes up a huge part of general aviation all over the world. Uh, here in the U.S. alone, corporate aviation is responsible for around 1.2 million jobs just on regional airports and municipal airports and maintenance and, and a lot of the operators that fly both corporate, charter, and private flying. Now, the COVID pandemic resulted in this boom in corporate aviation, which we're going to talk about with some of our guests here. Um, it's a really exciting interview that we had with two special guests. Now, we invited four, but getting four corporate pilots, uh, with myself included, in one room at the same time is virtually impossible, since we're doing it virtually. Uh, to line up our schedules was was pretty tough, and it took a couple months to actually get this down. But you're going to enjoy our two guests here. If you are listening to the audio version of this, why not go over to YouTube? You can see our pretty faces. Uh, it's youtube.com slash plain talking UK. While, while you're there, you can hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon, and you can be notified every time that we're about to go live and send out one of our videos. If you're listening to the audio version of this on your favorite audio uh, podcast uh, supplier, then welcome to the show. And I hope you enjoy this really fun episode, which is just Basically, three corporate pilots sitting around a table having a couple beers talking about uh, this really unique part of aviation. All right. Hello, everybody that's listening. This is our corporate aviation special that we've been talking about for a while. Uh, I'm Armando, uh, co-host of the PTUK podcast. And a little bit about my background and why I wanted to do this is, um, so I, I like, uh, like Jeff, who is one of our guests here, you'll here in a second. I had a full military career, 22 years. And as soon as I retired, uh, instead of going to the airlines, I went straight into corporate aviation. So I was flying at a, a scheduled part 135 and then a on-demand 135. And then we'll, we're gonna actually going to go into what all this means for our European listeners and, and for our US listeners too. But um, And then I ended up after doing two years at part 135s at a part 91 kind of unicorn gig, which is flying a private jet for a private family 10 minutes from my house. Um, it's one of those things that just fell in my, in my lap. But we'll talk about career paths and how this is a little bit different uh, than the traditional airline pilot. But of this group that is here tonight, I am actually the only one that was not at an airline. Um, so first guest up, Jeff, everybody knows you, but go ahead and introduce yourself anyways. Where, what's your background and how do you okay. end up here? Most of you probably know me as Colonel Jeff, uh, mostly from the APG, but uh, you've heard me on, uh, not as a guest on PTUK, but I know they've played a bunch of uh, some of the feedback I've sent in on my 9-11 story. I know it was over there as well. Um, my background is uh, I'm retired military. I flew F-15s most of my 22-year career. Uh, got out of the Air Force just before 9-11, uh, joined American Airlines just in time for that. And uh, Retired from American two years ago. This is my, I'm on my third 135 carrier. My first one was a part 91 that did mostly 135, which was interesting. Uh, they only had seven airplanes. Uh, so it was a small outfit. Left there, got hired at uh, one of the largest uh, 135 outfits in the world. Uh, I left there for management reasons. Uh, they were basically not what I wanted to do. Uh, they were going the wrong way in a hurry. And now I'm with a, a much smaller outfit. And right now I'm on a trip where I'm actually contracted out to one of the other large 135 carriers in the world. So um, that's pretty much my story. I've been, like I said, I've been flying for over 40, 40 years now. And uh, for me, it's just something I love to do. So yeah, and and our next guest is not even forty years old. So, <laughs> nope, got, oh, that, got seven that years hurt. <laughs> that 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 really hurt. 
Where's my See, wheelchair? <laughs> and, and and we'll talk about how how does a part 135 or part 91 crew get along for 15 days at a time in the cockpit is exactly doing this, right? You, you, you have to start out tepidly dancing around each other. And by the end of the trip, you're just, you know, uh, ribbing each other as, as hard as you can. But either way, uh, Stephen Ivey, another voice pretty uh, familiar to our podcast family. Stephen, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you doing all right yourself? I'm great. I'm great. Great. Um, great. Yeah, not working as hard as you guys, but I, but, <laughs> but but admiring all the locations that you go to. Yeah, well, I, you know, I haven't flown in um, over a month and a half now. Um, I just got done with uh, upgrade training a new airplane at my company, so I ha- I'm supposed to go out Monday and first time flying the plane. So looking forward to that. I've just uh, moved over to the uh, Phenom, so me and uh, Jeff are on the same plane now. So a lemon, can, the lemon, the mighty oh, lemon. I didn't know. Yes. I don't know. Everybody was flying the Phenom right now because yeah, was, did... was supposed to be on, but it's one o'clock in the morning over there, and he he said, "Ah, it's too late for me." And he's on the Phenom also. <laughs> no, he's on the Challenger. Yeah, now. He's on the Challenger. Yeah, he, oh, okay. he was on the Lemon. Yeah, he was he the was original the lemon. lemon driver. Yeah, original he's Lemon driver. Still, yeah, he's still the union president. <laughs> <laughs> but that checks because you just need a a squeaky wheel at the top and that's right that's right i love how enamored we're going to use that loosely enamored hip is with the with the lemon well his had an espresso machine that's why mine does not yeah <laughs> mine, mine doesn't have one either <laughs> well i make fun of pip because i'm flying the hawker which was his favorite airplane oh um, yeah yeah uh, it's a gentleman's airplane but it's not as cool as your guys airplane well, I don't know. I've uh, I'm still learning how to spell Garmin. I got the G A R part yeah, down, but after yeah. that, I lost. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I I've spoke nothing but Collins the last four and a half years, and now I'm trying yeah. to speak Garmin. It's it's different. And we can get into that in a little bit because, you know, the types of airplanes. While, you know, and you guys were both airlines. So Stephen, you were at an airline for a while, and and now yeah. you're doing this this uh, on demand charter, right? Um, you know, what, what you're flying, what equipment you're on is it factors into your decision and your career making decisions when you're at the airlines. I, I know from my, my experience, right. So you guys may have been different, but here I, I kind of think when you're in corporate, it's, it's whatever, whatever they throw your way, whatever the company is, is using to be most profitable, you just kind of. I don't think any of us are up for just collecting type ratings, but you just <laughs> you just kind of get shuffled along and airplane to airplane, right? Well, you know, from my from my side of it, I'm here because I just love flying. I like the idea of when I when I walk in that door, I turn left to the big picture window seat. And I've wanted to fly since I was very young. And I'm just doing this because I was too young to retire. Uh, but I'm flying with guys who are you know, younger than Steve and uh, who are sitting there, they're logging every, every little bit of instrument time of nighttime of approaches. Cause you know, they're, they're logging their time for the airlines. And uh, you know, the, the 135 guys recognize that they're pretty much just a breeding ground for future airline pilots. And right now they're bleeding airline pilot to the airlines. I mean, I just saw an article yesterday that Southwest lowered their uh, hourly requirements for new pilots. So it's probably going to get worse. So, you know, I'm now Steven's been there. So I don't know if he wants to go back or not. He probably will. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was gonna, just going to say, I, I'm not collecting type ratings. I'm collecting kind of quality of life and, you know, the compensation that comes along with it. But, you know, every time I go to work, I usually get asked why I'm still working here and not at an airline. Um so it's, it, I, I like it just because I, I don't have to deal with the commuting anymore. I don't have to deal with really bidding for a schedule. I know the days I'm going to work and I know the days I'm going to be off. Um, and then my company's got really good insurance benefits and everything. Um, but, you know, if I was presented an opportunity, I'd, I'd definitely look at it. But I'm, I'm happy where I'm at right now. Yeah, quality of life is a huge thing. Um for me right now, this, this gig is more of, uh, I joke with the guys I fly with this. I see this as just a flight to one good meal after another. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, 
but I could, but for a quality of life, Stephen, it's, you know, especially with people, you know, you're raising a young family and starting family life and everything. And it's, uh, uh, it's neat being home. Uh, I, I didn't have that in the military. I didn't have that option. And I can tell you from experience when my youngest was born, uh, I'd been with the airlines for about three years. Uh, I was still on reserve, but I saw more of that child even on reserve than I did my previous three children when I was in the military. Uh, so that's when I really learned about quality of life. And um, I'll tell this story. There was a guy I flew with at American when I was a 737 captain who was a couple thousand numbers senior to me. He was the co-pilot. And he was the number one co-pilot on the 73 in New York because he was doing it for that very reason, quality of life. He wanted to be around when his kids were little. He's a captain now, and uh, he could have been a long time before that, but it was all about his quality of life and what he could, you know, uh, what he didn't want to sacrifice. So that's that's a big player. Yeah, I mean, I, I rode the quality of life train at the regional I was at for two or three years. I got my seniority. I wondered I was getting the trips and days off. I wondered I was happy. I didn't really care that much about moving to the left seat just because I had a great quality of life. There wasn't really a reason to change it up. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember Man. uh Captain Jeff talking about that a couple of times on APG where um man, like we all want to sit. Everybody wants to sit left seat uh in, in whatever it is that they're flying. But especially at the airlines, I think there comes a point where you are balancing that seniority of the right seat. And and my brother, when he was uh at uh Com Air before it went defunct. He actually exact same thing, right? So he stayed as an as an FO uh, for longer than than his peers because he was a senior FO and and he had two toddlers at the time. Um, so that, that these are funny things to explain to our our listeners that are not directly involved in aviation. Um, I, I think it's funny for people to hear. Oh no, he chose his career to be you know in the right seat for either for seniority or sometimes you 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 really just don't want to take on the responsibility of, of the left seat and that's perfectly okay because because crews need a good left seater and a good right seater right yes and you know you look at captain jeff when the you know when the mad dog went away at acme um you know he could have gone to the 7576 but he he went to the the puppy because he was going to be senior and he was accustomed to getting his vacation and the trips he wanted uh, and that international lifestyle, it's that's a young man's game. I'm too old for that anymore. Yeah. Hey, I, I mean, if, if we're being honest, the, the <laughs> longest flight I've done was six hours and 15 minutes. And that was five hours too long. Like, it's just <laughs> like, I mean. well, you, well, in the lemon, you're never going to go that far. My longest flight in the lemon was about three hours, and we were just about out of gas. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I was talking to the instructors down there. The company record is four and a half hours in the lemon. Yeah. Going coast to coast. That is, that's pretty impressive. Coast to coast? Coast to coast. Went from Palm Springs to Miami. Nonstop. Oh, that way. Yeah, you could do it that way. You can't you can go the other yeah. way. <laughs> you can't go the other way. <laughs> it still counts, though. It still counts. Oh, my goodness. Ugh. Yeah. and I, my, heard, I heard thinking about it. My story is similar to yours, Jeff, where I spent, you know, at the end of my 22 years, at that point, I had a one-year-old. Uh, well, I guess I guess by the time I, I was retiring, she was uh, she was three and I was just a, a fictional character on an iPad, right? And you can't sit a three-year-old down to talk to a person on an iPad through FaceTime. Yeah. Um, so my initial goal was to go into the airlines and go to the 121 post-military. But I very quickly discovered the quality of life, predictable schedules um, were more of a better fit for me and uh, only because I didn't want to go through the process of going to a regional, being on reserve, commuting, all that stuff. And even though you you do get over that hump, right, a after about five years um, or, or maybe a different time frame. But Fifteen. <laughs> or 15, right? Fifteen on reserve. But it was bad timing. I mean, 9-11 happened and I almost got furloughed. I was 35 from the bottom when they stopped letting guys go. So I was you, just happy to have a job at that point. But again, I wasn't commuting. I could sit reserve at home. I was very lucky. Yeah. 
So. And, and the timing of this industry, as we've said a thousand times in all the timing. shows, it really yeah. is, right? We're riding this great wave right now. Three years from now, we could be back at another 9-11, another mm-hmm. COVID, yeah. and, and we're all scrambling for jobs. But um, I, Go ahead, Stephen. I, I was just going to say, you know, Jeff was touching on how the, these 135 operators are kind of breeding grounds for people going to 121. Um, our current upgrade time to get just to make captain is down to eight months now with the company. And previously before COVID, it was five years. So that's how much turnover and growth yeah. is going through the, you know, on-demand charter operators right now. Yeah, it's unheard of. It's amazing, right? I mean, and, and that's the coveted thing early in your career is you want that, that turbine PIC time, multi-engine turbine PIC time um because that's once you've got that sort of the world is your oyster but that's really the hardest thing to get in our career field but again talk going back to the uh, quality of life thing there were guys in my last company especially and even at this company that i've run into the few guys i've met already who are in this for quality of life um there's a retired american guy here and he's uh, he's an fo only but he helps in the training department at this at, at our headquarters for like indoc and stuff there were guys at my previous company that um, were there, had you know, weren't going to go to the airlines because it was quality of life. I mean, having a now that company who had a schedule for an entire year, uh, where I'm at now, my schedule is done uh, four months at a pop. So, like, I know when I'm going to be at work until the end of April. Then May first, it starts a new schedule, and we bid those just like the airlines. It's all done by seniority. I think. Where Stephen is, it's similar. The, his might be a year. I'm not sure, but yeah. we know our ske- we know our schedule. It's a long time, a long way out. Right. So, you know, especially and you know, Armando, you're you're halfway between us, I guess, age wise. Hmm. At my age, you know, some of the people I need to see as a doctor is like, well, you need to come back and see us in six months. You want to schedule that now? I got uh, when I was at the airline. I said, no, that ain't going to happen. I don't know my schedule. I don't know my schedule for the next two weeks. What are you talking about? You want to know next month? Yeah. No. <laughs> So being able to just make a doctor's appointment or even schedule a vacation um, or, you know, to have ideas, am I going to be able to get to this, this wedding in May? You know, those are things I can actually plan for now, which I never could before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I want to go back to the cycles and the industry ups and downs. We've mentioned it. You can't record a show now about, about a segment of aviation without just like, just glossing over COVID and the pandemic, but there was 2020 was a really, really unique period for corporate aviation in that while the airlines were all essentially shutting down, corporate aviation experienced a huge boom. Um, My understanding is corporations and private individuals still needed to get places. Uh, There wasn't the airline schedules that supported those kind of travel. And operators, uh, big operators such as uh, NetJets and Wheels Up and FlexJet, ExoJet, they saw this massive boom of people that had that kind of resource, whether they were individuals or corporations or small companies. And and just like we've seen this this rise in in the airline hiring, the the corporate side experienced a huge boom that we are all benefiting from now. Um, you know, it's funny you bring that up. That's how I got my first job. I mean, I, I was still at the airlines in, in, in most of, for the first nine months of 2020. And uh, I had a buddy who had an in with the first place I got hired and they'd fired uh, most of their pilots when the lockdown started that spring of 2020. So they basically had uh, two captains. That was all they had left. Mm-hmm. And uh, those two guys were flying their butts off by the end of the summer. And I was looking at my retirement coming and I'm thinking I wasn't going to get hired by anybody, anybody uh, until the following summer at the earliest. And I mean, I was out of the cockpit for two months (laughs) before I was back flying again because they needed pilots so bad. And uh, that was a big surprise. The corporate guys, you know, a lot of people didn't want to fly because they didn't want to be on the airplanes with all the other, as Nev puts it, the unclean or the unwashed. <laughs> and uh, so they were, 
the people who had enough money to do it were flying, you know, the charters. They were buying the charters to get from place to place. I was flying a lot of families around. Uh, one trip was bringing a kid home from college from uh, University of Miami in Ohio all the way back to yeah. Palm Springs, I think. Her and her two cats. <laughs> yeah, so I did, I did a lot of uh, kids to college trips during the pandemic. Yep, did that too. Took uh, one girl up to uh, Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, I think it's King's College. I was there. Um, and so, yeah, the pandemic was a boon for, you know, the 135 and the 91 operators to do a lot of flying with people because they didn't want to be with all the bodies and, a, yeah. you know, in a cattle car. Well, yeah. and then once and you've, a, once you've tasted it, it's hard to oh, go yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hard to go it's hard back. To go back. Uh, yeah. It's hard to give up that Lincoln Continental to go back to a Volkswagen. <laughs> Stephen, what yeah. was your experience kind of? Well, I mean, I, I was still at the airlines during um, the uh, COVID and everything. And it was, you know, it was slow for the first six, eight months and everything. But uh, when I came over here, it was, everyone was talking about, you know, the first couple of months was, it kind of was slow. And then the, when the summer hit, it picked back up because nobody wanted to fly the airlines, mostly because the schedules were just awful. And then the business guys couldn't really get anywhere in the same day. So a lot of people were buying into these various programs and everything. And um, the company I work for actually quit selling their lowest time contracts because they just didn't have the planes, they didn't have the people to cover the flying. And they also, the people that already had their contracts established weren't using them. So their hours were rolling over year to year. So when 2021 hit, people had double the amount of hours that they usually do. So the flying was up like 60% because people were cashing in on their contracts. And <laughs> so it's just, it was this huge wave. So when I got hired back uh, March of last year, they were still on that wave. And I think this past November, it finally stabilized to where everything was back to normal. People had cashed in their extra hours and everything, but they're still not selling their lowest uh, contract right now because they don't have enough airplanes and they don't have enough pilots to keep up with the demand they have right now. So I think a lot, a lot of companies are having that issues, at least the larger operators are. Um, so they'll, you know, farm it out to some third party to do the flying and they'll still sell them a contract. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's what Jeff's doing. So, you know, so this is a great segue to this. So we, we throw out part 91, 91K, part 135. Yeah. We throw it out all the time, right? We know what we're talking about. And one of the funny things that I put in the, in the notes preparing for today was, on one day in one day you can fly under all three parts yep. uh which is yep. very unique to to our little chunk of the career field um but, uh, how would you guys explain the difference between part 135 91k which almost nobody knows about and part 91 all right I, I, my limit my limited knowledge is this i've never flown 91 until i went to my first company and they I did some really? there. Oh, wow. Yeah. I never did. Yeah. It was interesting because, yeah, I've never done GA. So they oh, told yeah, me. Oh, yeah. That's do right. A, okay. They, they, you know, my SIM check, they told me to do a night conventional pattern. I go, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy just looked at me, go, what do you mean, what's that? I go, I've never flown part 91. So, in a simple way, this is how I view the difference between 91, 135, and 121. 91, no rules. 135, some rules 121 your hands are tied <laughs> yeah that's that's about the, that's the way i see it i mean he's not wrong <laughs> 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 i mean um so i mean but my operator it, it, it kind of makes it easy for you it says these are the three that you operate under and you will operate under 135 at all times unless you need to operate under part 91 to get to a passenger or get out of an airport to go pick somebody up. Yeah. Then you can revert to the 91. Everything else, 135 all the time, regardless. So, I'm lucky. We, do, we don't do 91 at all. At my well, well, yeah, so, I mean, you know, 91 is basically a reposition flight. So, I mean, that's just... But it's duty, I, ti it's duty time as well. It's, stu it's still duty time. That, that's the and big thing. It's still duty time. There's weather requirements change and... 
somewhat. Well, well, so I mean, we just revert back to one thirty five, and our big, our biggest thing is our op specs that my company has has uh, differences between one thirty five and ninety one k and ninety one. So you got to pay attention to what your charter is because that determines where you can get in and out of and if you can leave the go places. Okay, I'm going to play so, the idiot here. What's 91K? Okay. Armando, you brought it up. <laughs> so 91K is basically where you are filling in for someone's um, corporate jet. So let's say that General Motors Gulfstream goes down. They'll call us to go fill in for them. That would be a 91K flight. And a lot of it's legality for legal reasons, insurance requirements for CEOs, executives, and everything. So if we crash, they get X, Y, and Z. If it's 135, it falls under a different thing. It's, that's the big difference between it all. But mostly when you're 91K, you're filling in on a corporate side, you know, a corporate jet. You're pretty much the backup. Okay. Yeah, it has to do with, with fractional ownership. So when, that, when, yeah, that too. when somebody buys in, so Stephen was mentioning that some of, some of his clients, his company's clients, um, they'll, they'll buy block time, right? So they'll buy 30 hours from your company or 50 hours from your company, right? Some, something to that effect. Yeah. 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 They, they buy you for from 25 to 500 hours blocks. Yeah. For, for a yeah. company that is a, it's a planned expense. It's a known expense that they're going to say, Hey, we're going to buy 50 hours. And we know from our previous years, travel histories that that is going to suffice more, more or less for our travel needs for the upcoming year or period or whatever they, they signed the contract for. Part 91K, the individual is actually purchasing a fraction of an aircraft in that fleet. It's like being part of a boat club. <laughs> what, what that enables you to do is what you were saying, Jeff. Uh, now you can operate under part 91 rules because that is an owner an owner flight but they only own 1 80th of the airplane um so now you don't have oh, to good grief yeah and now you don't have to necessarily it gets operate. better though it gets better though <laughs> you can have it <laughs> yeah well, well what are you alluding to well, also, I mean, so then you throw in the charter brokers, which mm -hmm. are generally 135, but some of the people that are in this brokerage actually own aircraft. And sometimes when you go pick them up, you it's their aircraft you're actually picking them up on. So you're like 91K slash 135. So it's like, yeah, you know, it complicates things even more. It gets very murky, and for yeah. for the company that I, my last company, which was a 135 on demand, um, at the top of our trip sheet, it would be in in giant letters. Um, this is a part 91 trip or a part 135 trip, yeah. and uh, like 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 you mentioned, Stephen, our management, our chief pilot had said, to the maximum extent possible, we will operate all flights as uh, as a 135, unless you don't need to. Yes. <laughs> so huh? for, the, for the highest safety and risk management, we would operate under part 135, uh, alternate minimums, crew duty day limitations, um, maintenance, uh, unless the pilot, if it was a part 91 flight, unless the pilot deemed it more beneficial to work under part 91 rules very very murky uh, in this yeah. yeah yeah oh boy so 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 one that really get at my company that we got to really pay attention to is because we're 135 eligible on-demand operator um where we have a special program that says our landing distances can be x y and z under certain yeah. conditions and everything well, I'm sure you know, on the lemon, you really stretch that because if your runway is wet or contaminated, you don't fall under that. Or you do fall under that, excuse me. But if you're 91, it's you a, don't. It, it, it doesn't. So it's <laughs> like, that's when it starts getting murky. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and as we're throwing these around, I, I did write some examples of names of companies that people might recognize. So uh, even even in part 135, there's there's four different levels, right? So there's like a single pilot, single airplane, 
Um, that's, a, that's a cowboy of the sky that can charge for his services and needs no general operations manual, needs no specific training, um, as long as it's same pilot with the same airplane. Then you get into like different combinations of multiple pilots with one airplane or multiple airplanes with one pilot. And then what most of us are kind of talking about is on demand 135. That is somebody literally buying uh, uh -huh. a, time. A, a ticket at a time from A to B. At, and then the highest level of 135 is 135 scheduled. Um, so that's like Contour Airlines, Southern Airways Express, uh, Mokalele, which I think got bought by Air Southern. Force. Southern, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Boutique Air, so, uh, Air Choice One. Those guys were part 135, but could even be code share with a part 121. Yep. I, and I'll give you another good example of that <sighs> is now you got SkyWest 121 and you've got SkyWest Charters 135 now. Yep. Yeah. But it's the same company. <laughs> yeah. So. Yep operators uh, so and yeah. then and then netjets netjets can do e everything they have a certificate that's a 135 but they actually operate um i forget what their call sign is it's jet card or something like that which exact their, jet exact yeah. jet that's their yeah. 91k side of the house um and then and a netjet call sign is the part 135 on demand side of the house so even their call signs change but the same airplane same crew um so net 91k is yeah. netjex flexjet plane sense huge operator of pilatus uh yeah. aircraft so those are fractional ownerships um and then believe it or not part 91 here in charlotte so i, I picked some operators uh lowe's home improvement store yeah uh, waffle house based in atlanta bank of america yeah. they have fleets of airplanes but they are yeah. part 91 because they are not contract carriage holding out. Uh, so you could have, for example, Lowe's flight department here at Charlotte Douglas has five Falcons, 12 pilots, all part 91, even though, you know, they're really, really nice jets because yeah. it's all internal to them. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I know um, Exojet does uh, the on demand and the scheduled 135. They have a, I think it's a CRJ 200 a couple yeah. of them that they fly between florida yeah. and new york yep. and it's Quarter scheduled channels. it's like it's like every day or five times a week or something like that yeah and, but again uh they do uh non-scheduled too yeah so that's crazy huh <laughs> so yeah. one of the now that you guys have both been in in uh, I guess the charter side the corporate side i read an fna an faa definition that business aviation is incidental to a business such as Lowe's and Bank of America. Corporate aviation is the term that the FAA recognizes to encompass all of this, um, which I think all falls under general aviation <laughs> as opposed to commercial aviation. Yeah. But, so now that you guys have, have, have been in it for a couple of years, one of the things, because I was never an airline guy, we talked a little bit about the quality of life. What are some of the differences between airline flying and this kind of corporate flying and charter flying? Uh, I mean, the, the big thing for me is the amount of uh, pre-flight planning that's not done for you as as much as there is at the airline. I mean, the airline, you, you show up, you get the release, you load the flight plan. That's pretty much it. I mean, that, I mean, you, that's really it. Um, I, now you've got to do the same thing, but now you got to verify it because my company doesn't have... Uh, FAA certified um, dispatchers. So you got to review the flight plan. You got to review the fuel planning. You got to deal with catering. You got to deal with get figuring out the fuel, loading it up, all the plane services that you need. You know, you need a ground power unit. You need lab service. Uh, did the airplane get cleaned last night? It's everything you have to deal with now as to oppose with the 121. You just show up, look at the paperwork, load the box up, load the people up and you go. And I mean, you do deal with some of that stuff, you know, but you have a lot larger support staff to help you as to where in the um, charter world, you got to deal with a lot of that on your own. And it's kind of hard to get support from the company 
when stuff starts going south because I mean they're not there they don't have contacts for the people that are at the airport so it's just you and whoever you got there to work out the issues you're, you're no long at 121 you're just a pilot and and what we're doing now we're a lot more than just the pilot we're the pilot we're the flight attendant we're the gate agent we're the ticket agent we're the cargo handler sometimes we're the fuel sometimes we're maintenance um you're you're the dispatcher uh uh, we don't have any dispatchers either. We have flight followers. So I have to do, before every flight, I have a couple of reports I have to do. One is a safety report, uh, a, uh, an assessment. Uh, then I have to follow the flight plan. I have to check my own weather um, and the rules that go along with that. I have to make sure I have alternate weather and alternates. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's all on me. I have to figure out the fuel load. I do get guidance on fuel cost based on the FBOs we're going to. Uh, you know, you're going to Aspen, you want to land it with as much gas as possible because it's like ten dollars a gallon, and you're coming out of, uh, you know, uh, someplace in Denver, APA, let's say Centennial or something like that, where it's you know only seven dollars a gallon. Yeah, you want to get it in Centennial, not in Aspen. Well, so just to go on the fuel thing for just a second. So, like, my company has a separate division under our umbrella that does fuel contract hedging so when right. you look on our app it'll sit there and tell you the percentage difference where you're going and everything and it's kind of funny you go to aspen and I, that's actually lower than some of the places that are around there because of just the contract they have in place yes with them. Yeah. and we, have, we that, have those too yeah yeah so and, but, so and also not not to go too much into it but depending on the fbo and stuff you tend to go in more empty than you do other places. You yes, you, you kind of steer the passengers. And, oh, we don't want to go to that FBO. We want to go to this one across the street. It's only 100 yards away, you know. That's, but, yeah, because the gas money is going to come out of their pocket eventually. Yeah, well, this, this all is right. all amazing to me because as a Part 91 guy, I only work for the owner of the airplane. And and all of these contract, that, that these negotiations you guys are talking about fall uh, on my dimples, my smile, and my charming personality. <laughs> Literally trying to haggle for 50 cents or 75 cents off. Sometimes I can get to a dollar off if I'm buying, you know, a thousand gallons or something like that. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. well it, it, that, that's not a bad thing, though, because there's some places that we go, like my situation a couple months ago in Bozeman that I had where one FBO ran out of gas and the other one had some. I had to call the company to get a contract to them so we could actually get gas because you just can't start pumping until you have one because they don't know if you're good for it or not, even though they know who you're working for. You know, they got to have a contract. I see. We carry credit cards. Well, I mean, we, we do, too, but they got to have it approved at the office to activate it for whatever location you're at. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. we don't. That's, yeah, we that's, don't do that. that's kind of a pain. Yeah. One of the nice things about the, the corporate flying versus the 121 flying is that, uh, for one thing, it's a limited number of passengers. I've only had one run in uh, with a passenger, and it was because the company sent us to the wrong FBO. Uh, so we parked. And this guy was not happy, <laughs> but I dealt with it. You know, I haven't, I haven't had to call the cops to have people take off the airplane. Like I did at one twenty one. my record was nine <laughs> wow. um, at one time. So uh, that's a nice thing about it. The, uh, um, the other thing I've seen, and I was at the airlines a lot longer than Steven was, um, my first trip at American, I remember we we're on a crew van going to the hotel and a Northwest crew gets on with us. And uh, the young FO looks at his captain and goes, boss, what hotel are we going to? He goes, I don't know, but Americans going there. So it must be a good hotel. <laughs> uh, that changed uh, over the years. And I can tell you that uh, I've been with all three carriers I've stayed that I've been with, I'm staying at much nicer hotels than I was with the airlines. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a, it's a flight from one good meal to another. <laughs> Yeah, for the most I, part. I mean, there's some long days. I mean, I've done 14 hour days. I've done a, a lot of 12 hour days. I've done a lot of sitting around, but you know, it's, I, I explained it this way. When I, when I was at, in the military, I was speaking Latin. Then I went to the 120 world war and I had to learn Greek. 
Well, now I'm in the 135 world and I had to learn Russian. <laughs> it's even a different alphabet. I mean, my first week in school down at CAE, where you just were, Stephen, it was like I had no idea what they were talking about terminology wise. It was terms I had never heard of. Well, well you know, that, that, that's a great point. So I was the only upgrade in a class of six. Everybody else was a new hire. So the first day they're going over operational stuff for the company and all these rules and everything. And the instructor keeps asking me, he's like, so what do you do out on the line? It's like, what do you do out on the line? And then I'd, I'd give the answer. Then he'd leave and be like, so this is what we really do on the line. <laughs> you know, but, it, it, but, but he's right. I mean, it's really a different language. I mean, it's what, what you think, you know, how you operate an airplane and all the operational stuff completely goes out the window because it's it's a completely different operation and the stuff you deal with is different like if at the regional if you didn't get catering oh cool we're going 30 minutes not a big deal then we're coming right back oh it's here, a big deal at, 135 it, yeah it's a phone call and then you got to call the company call the caterer and then you got to sit there explain to the customer why it didn't show up yeah so. and i want to talk a little bit about the customers here in a second but but sticking with jeff so how did you how did you make that transition uh from uh -huh. from the 121 to all these responsibilities that we're now talking about well, i think you have a unique background because the military for that long yeah. you, you're a team player yeah. and, and you do whatever needs to be done but well, unlike the big boys uh i did all my own flight plans so in, in the military i did all my own weather yeah. and i'm going back to the days where you know there wasn't pulling it up on an iPad. I mean, I'm looking at the old, I actually had, if I had not gone to the Academy, I would have had a minor in meteorology because I took so many weather classes when I was there. I could read the charts when I'd go get the weather briefing that they, you know, like the weather channel puts up. And those were the kind of weather briefings you got in those days. And so I knew how to do that stuff. And when I went to 121, I kept doing it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'd show up and, uh, I pull up the flight plan and I look at the weather on the radar and, I, and the skipper would show up and I say, boss, we're not going that way. He goes, why not? I go, look at the radar picture. And I plotted the route through the weather. He goes, oh yeah, we're not going that way. Yeah. <laughs> talk to dispatch and change the routing. And so it was part of me to do anyway. So when I came back to having to do it at 135, it was just a different format I had to learn. And um, the computer ways of doing the flight plans and uh, checking the weather is so much simpler than I was, you know, had to do in the military. I wasn't dealing with 175-1s or 175s yeah. or DD-1801s or, you know, and ugh. so it was just, you know, flightplan.com and made it I, so easy. And I kind of do want to touch for both of you on one thing. It's a stigma that was previously held and had been there for a long time. And I'm curious to see if it's still there about 121 guys going over to a 135. And I have heard plenty of stories over the last decade of that even coming up in interviews at 135s, maybe smaller 135 operators where <clears throat> they are apprehensive to, to take on a 121 pilot uh, because there is so much more personal responsibility. Have you seen anything like that or? Yes. Uh, there is some of the some of the guys, especially the guys who've been around longer at these at 135s have a, uh, a grudge against guys like me who've come in from uh, 121 carriers. Uh, probably not so much on Stevens because he had because he wasn't. I'm sorry, Stephen, but they don't consider the regionals really 121 over here. Yeah, um, OK, <laughs> that, that's actually I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, it's. It's it's different enough because the jets aren't that much bigger. Uh -huh. um, but for guys like me, especially retired guys, they think we come over here thinking we know it all. Um, and I know there was a gal in my phenom class who was coming off the 787. And she'd been flying for a long time. But I told her she, she's going to have her hands full. For one, she's used to, you know, positive rate gear up autopilot's on for the next eight hours you know and you know getting up and taking a three-hour nap wherever she's going 
And that's not going to happen anymore. She's not going to have that dispatcher watching over her shoulder the whole time. She's going to be doing all this extra work. And she's going to be learning a new language uh, with a lot more responsibility than she probably had before. The So, but some of the guys still come over, reti retirees come over, thinking it's going to be a cakewalk. And it's not. Uh, the guy who got me hired at my first company almost walked out of CAE because it was so difficult for him. And he warned me how hard it was. And it was hard. It was one of the hardest things I'd ever done that first time. Now, the second two times was a lot easier just because I, I spoke the language by that point. Um, but there is that kind of black mark that you show up. And I've, done, I've had to deal with it twice because coming out of the military as a senior officer, uh, guys kind of took that the wrong way too. Because a lot of guys, you know, you get a retired lieutenant colonel, retired colonel gets in the cockpit. And he still thinks he's, you know, the big wig on the flight deck. And he's not. He's the co-pilot. And he's trying to pull rank. And, you know, I never had that attitude. Um, I can tell a, a quick story about why I didn't have that attitude. It's kind of funny. I had a, a one star in the nose of my airplane on a student sortie. We were supporting <laughs> uh, another student. And I, we were doing an air-to-air -air engagement, and I briefed the general that we're going to do this one maneuver, and this kid's going to put his lift vector on our airplane. We need to turn into a big screaming yellow chicken. We need to get out of the way because that student's going to hit us if we don't. And as advertised, as soon as he's got his lift vector on us, lift vector on us, and about the time I couldn't stand it anymore, I, put two, I finally put two negative Gs on the airplane. Um, and you both probably know what this book is, your, the audience one. It's an IFR sub. It's a five by eight inch book that's about an inch thick. Flying book, and I'm sitting and looking at it, it's right in front of his face. I'm thinking, I gotta put G on the airplane. And I had just been promoted to major. I hadn't pinned it on yet. And, and I don't know if you know about this. In the military, when you get promoted, a senior officer can do what's called redline you. He just takes the promotions, draws a red line through your name. And as I go to put the, the G on the airplane, I'm watching this red line go through my name because I know where this book's going. So I G up the airplane, bang, it smacks him right in the face. And I'm going, well, there goes my promotion. Yeah. We get in the debrief and it's just him and I, and he's yelling at me going, damn it, Jeff, you told me exactly what that little punk was going to do. And about the time I realized I needed to be a screaming yellow chicken, the book hit me in the face. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there were guys who come over with that attitude. Just yeah. like um, guys who have maybe been a captain before, and I saw this at American too, a guy had been a captain, but after 9-11, he got pushed back for the right seat, and it was a three-man crew, and he's playing captain, and the regular captain finally had enough and read him the frickin' riot act, and he deserved every bit of it. So, yeah, there's, there's that stigma for the airline guys in the 135. So, so I guess the, the point there is that all, all transitions are hard, because I, I know not going to the airlines, but going from military to 135, I was flying, you know, I was on the Osprey and that's a pretty maintenance heavy airplane, <laughs> um, a large maintenance footprint. And, <laughs> but, but we would never take off with items, you know, broken. And, and I was used to decades of you land, whether even if you land at four in the morning after a night sortie, you land, and there's a whole team of maintainers there yeah. and that airplane will be fixed by noon the next day. Um, and I, I remember from a risk management standpoint and a maintenance and safety standpoint, that was one of my biggest adjustments going to a 135 was airplanes with MEL items. Um, and then questioning, I mean, I, I was at an operator that both pilots, we would look at each other and say, Hey, one of us needs to take a picture of that tire because it it is definitely not serviceable, but maintenance would refuse to to change them. Ah, it's got it's got four more landings left in it. Um, and we would literally take pictures with our phones saying, Hey, when the FAA comes calling, we're gonna show them that we called maintenance control. We we and it's easy to sit in a chair and say, I'm not taking that airplane, right? I'm the PIC. But when you have the pressures that we're talking about of the clients, the company, um, people, that that is, it's a different kind of pressure than in the 121s when when the client 
is breathing down your neck. Um, and people have different reactions to that. I mean, well, even more so because it's all contract maintenance. When you land someplace, there may not be any maintenance at all, not even contract. You may have to have a team come in. When I was on the citation, it was typical that, you know, you'd have to either ferry the jet to a, a, site, a, a place where Textron had a workers or they would have to drive somebody there. So, um, you know, the company I have now, they have a main base and they, they actually schedule the airplanes to fly through the main base every two weeks for service checks because mm. we have a maintenance team there. Um, but that was another, you know, like you said, you know, how many MELs can I stand on this airplane at the 121 world? I can, uh, when I was on the A300, that airplane was an MEL nightmare. I mean, I can't tell you many times there were two days in a row where the captain looked at me and goes, we're not going to board because I don't know if we're taking the airplane. And uh, I've refused two airplanes over MEL issues when I was at American. Yeah. So um, they were easy to refuse. But <laughs> maintenance didn't want me to take it either, I don't think. So, yeah, you, you know, I'll, I'll say my, my maintenance experience this company, it's actually been really good. Um, they generally don't question you too hard. And, you know, they usually will either get their contract folks out but um we, we've got a we own a contract maintenance firm underneath our umbrella so it makes it a little bit easier when we do oh, yeah. down places because they've got a huge network and we've got several maintenance spaces and generally the airplane will go through there at least every two weeks like jeff's does and it'll get you know it's uh preventative maintenance done and stuff worked on and everything yeah one I, of the I, best thing that's ever happened to us is uh, cell phone cameras and especially yes. with the quality, I can't tell you how many, like you said, taking pictures of tires, you'll take pictures of screens. We had a uh, a jet where the, uh, the environmental control system was acting up. And so we pull up the screens showing the synoptics of the system. And I'm just taking pictures of video, watching this valve open and close, which shouldn't be doing. And, you know, and you can send it to maintenance. Uh, every issue you have on the airplane, it's a, it's a photo going to maintenance or anything you have questions on, you just send a picture to maintenance or a video. Um, so it, it comes in really handy. I did it at the airlines too, once in a while. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'll just throw in too, you know, since we were talking about the transition 121 to 135 and something that I, I just noticed cause I've had a friend that did this, but um, you know, you, I think a lot of younger people that come through flight schools and CFI that go to airlines first, they get the mentality of just making a left-hand turn and doing what they have to up front. That's it. They don't interact with customers. Um, they don't really deal with anything. They don't really have that mentality of I'm gonna be a captain one day. I'm just they just have the mentality I'm in the right seat. I'll do whatever I'm told. I'll do it. So when they come over to 135, they struggle because they're working. I mean, for me, it's 12 hours every day you're out. You're having to deal with all this stuff and they just don't have the motivation or determination to do all this extra stuff and they just quit and go back to the airlines because they don't want to deal with it. This this is an outstanding segue. This is exactly what I wanted to talk about next. Um, and, and I want to talk about the people and the clients and that personal interaction. Um, funny little, little story. My brother also flies. He's flown. He, he was a 121 guy until... Uh, 2009 and then he went corporate and he is currently a check airman at his sort of medium-sized 135 on demand and and on his check rides he asks who has operational control of this of this aircraft right so most of us would say well i don't know you know the director of operations dispatch and his he always goes no sales sales does uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's kind of a it's tongue-in-cheek yeah, yeah. The, the but legal it's the answer. correct. It's it's not the real answer, but it is the it is a real answer. answer. Yeah. It's exactly. the correct answer. <laughs> but and, and I kind of want to dispel some of the myths. So, well, and and one of the reasons that that I wanted to do this kind of special show about corporate aviation is is we we don't really talk about it a lot. We we do all the on all the podcasts. We do all these commercial stories. We do military stories. We do uh, some general aviation stories. Um, but very rarely do we actually talk about the business, the corporate side of the house, and some of those uh, statistics that I pulled out from NBAA, um, where 
because because I think a lot of people think, well, it's it's all Fortune 500 companies that have these these giant fleets, and, nope. and the, the actual number is is only three percent of the aircraft of the fifteen thousand uh, registered U.S. registered business aircraft. Only three percent belong to a Fortune 500 company. The rest of them, it's it's everything. It's uh, it's per, small companies. Uh, including governments, uh, universities, you got charities, you got churches, uh, businesses, large, small, you got private owners. Um, that that's kind of the the ownership of of the business aviation, corporate aviation side of the house. And there was a great YouTube video that I watched a couple of years ago. I, I don't remember um, who published it, but it, it had to do with the economics of of private flying. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it, it's, it's a great. Um... Windover Productions. Yeah, it's a great yeah. way to explain to, especially your family and friends, because they're like, "What are you just doing? You're just shuttling rich people, rich people around." I'm like, well, yes, but no, there's a, there's a reason, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and and, and it kind of comes down, especially on the corporate side of the house, where, um, so I looked it up. I, I initially I found out that the of Fortune 500 companies, the average CEO makes about 21 million dollars a year. That's 6,700 bucks an hour. That's a give or take 60, 70 hours a week, right? So $6,700 an hour. That, that's the extreme. So let's go back or down to a, a medium-sized company, maybe a, a beverage distributor, um, a construction company that that buys block time from, from an on-demand charter. So you're talking the CEO of that will probably make somewhere between two and $400,000 a year. Um, now when you tack on that time, an hourly time, what is it worth to the company times two or three or four individuals? And kind of the, the story that I came up with was, was one that I've done actually quite a, quite a few times, which is a, a company from, from Atlanta. They build a Chick-fil-A's. They, what they do is they, they purchase the land, they build the building and then lease that back to Chick-fil-A. Um, small, small size construction company, but they're always traveling with a team of four. And Chick-fil-A's aren't always in downtown Atlanta and downtown Washington, D.C., where there's a major hub. They're going to be in Owensboro, Kentucky, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, <laughs> in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, right? Yeah. So when you get four individuals from a company or a project, uh, and a lot of times it's the company plus its client or its customer. They're mm -hmm. they're bringing their customers aboard, and you you calculate all that time to go from Atlanta to Owensboro, Kentucky. I don't know, but actually, Stephen, you it, you wouldn't know, right? Like, yeah, it's um not about um eight and a half hours to get to uh, Owensboro, Kentucky from Atlanta. Right, oh, so that's bad, that's yes. <laughs> driving time. Uh, or if you do want to take Delta out of Atlanta, now you got to show up. Two hours, debatable, two, two and a half hours before your flight. Yep. Uh, take your flight. You fly into maybe Lexington. A a the Evansville. Evansville. Okay. Yep. So you and fly into next state Evans over. <laughs> yep. And then it's an hour and 10 minute drive to Owensboro. Right. So you do that after you get your rental car. Yeah. Uh, and now, you, so you're not there before 1 p.m. at, at, at the earliest. No. And now you go do your site visits. Maybe there's two stores you got to hit. You've already missed the last flight from Evansville back to Atlanta, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So now you got to spend the night. And the first flight out of Evansville is probably at 7 in the morning. Gets them back to Atlanta at 9. Now you got to get back to your car. So that's 9.30, maybe 10 o'clock. Yep. So you don't go to work till noon the next day. What we do is now we will pick them up from Atlanta Peachtree to Cab, or Fulton County, or whatever airport is closest to their headquarters, they drive up to the car. Now we'll we'll talk about some of these stories. Oh yeah, <laughs> they drive their car Gosh. to the front door of the airplane, where uh, Jeff greets them with a, a firm handshake. Steven's already in the seat, and he's got the APU running. He's got the air conditioning going. The the coffee's hot. The ice is cold. The papers are there. They drive up. They close the door and we're you gone. Start, you start turning and you're gone because you've already picked up weather clearance, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and what would you say in the Finam, uh, 
PDK to Owensboro? Oh, an hour tops. Tops. Hour fifteen. Yeah, hour fifteen max. Yeah. Yeah. So they're there. Their rental car meets them at at the door. So now they're there by nine in the morning. Yeah. They can hit two stores, three stores, or one long visit. Come back to the airport at four thirty, and you've got them home for dinner. By- Dinner. by dinner time they can sit yeah. down and talk business over dinner yep and that's another great point you can't talk business when you're sitting in 16f uh when you fly with corporate aviation that's productivity time yep. yes they, they are back there wargaming what situation or interacting with their client or customer um so not only you're are you saving that company time and money but it's also productivity time as opposed to idle time. So that's when, I, I don't know, what's the fin I'm go for? 2,500 an hour, 3,000 an hour? Um, I think uh, we bill at 65. I think, ours, an hour. I think ours is 46 or 48. Yeah, so, okay. So uh, probably a Pilatus King Air is more on the $2,000 an hour. So Phenom, 6,000 bucks an hour. You've already made that up. Yeah. yeah. The company's made Easily. that up. Uh, easily and that's where uh, the economics of this makes sense and and I know there's a lot of naysayers about carbon footprint and you know is it effective all that stuff really these jets are so efficient um it's 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 negligible uh compared yeah. to other industries and and to be honest it's 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 where what we do makes sense um yeah I mean, th- those are honestly my favorite trips is when you're doing, you know, running some business crew through multiple stops or one stop or whatever. I am. Um, I had a, um, I think it was like six people. We had them for four days and we left Connecticut, went to the West Coast and hit uh, the Midwest and then a couple other places in the Midwest. And then we went back to Connecticut over the course of four days. And it was just the same people going, you know, to wherever they need to go to have their meetings. Um, I think on oh, my my IOE flight when I first started here, um, the um, there was this group of people. There's eight of them, and it's just this meat processing company, and they were going out to the Midwest, and we stopped and dropped them off at these places that were closest to where their plants were at, and they were going to go do inspections and. I was just talking to them. They were literally going back later that evening, back to Montana, and there was another plane that would come through and get them. Um, you know, and then I think another, uh, more recently, a big cl- clothing brand that we subbed for, they they were going out to do an inspection at a um, warehouse, and they were working the whole way out there. As soon as they hopped off, they were on their way to go do whatever they do. They were going back later that day. So... Yeah, even I mean, I picked up Pearl Jam of all things to take. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, and I picked them up in San Diego to take them to Paso Robles. I mean, they almost driven it in the time it yeah. took them, you know, because yeah, it was. But it's the same thing. We call them roadshows. Where I picked up a client yeah. uh, in uh, New Jersey, and we spent the next four days in Florida. I mean, I dropped them off in Tampa, picked them up the next day in Sarasota. <laughs> right? Yeah, really. Yeah. Took them down to Naples. We went over to Miami, back up to, I mean, it was just all over uh, the East Coast of uh, Florida. Yeah. yeah and, and, so, and some of our clients have genuine security concerns, whether they're, yeah. they're leaders in their businesses, uh, celebrities, uh, you know, yeah. uh, actors, musicians. Those are, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of Netflix over the last couple of years and you start seeing all these shows that talking about the paparazzi and, 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 and just these genuine security concerns. This is a great avenue for them to really be able to get from A Well, to like D. you said, they, they can, in a lot of places, they can drive right up to the airplane because you guess who TSA is? You are. And um, so you check their IDs, their bags go right on the airplane as they get there. You get them situated, you give them the crew brief, you give them the passenger briefing, and you climb in the seat, and the other guy's got the flight plan loaded, he's got the clearance and the ATIS, and you're cranking engines, and by the from the time the door's closed to the time you're taxiing, it's probably just a couple minutes. Yeah. And, and so. that's a that's I wanted to touch on that too, the interaction. Um how do you guys take that on? So now now you have a 
you have face to face, you have a personal interaction uh, with the clients. Uh, on demand charters, you, you maybe see a little bit more clients, but but like you're you were describing Stephen, or in my case, it's the same family. You get to know them. You get to know yeah. them, their dogs' names that are traveling with them, yeah. um, their kids. <laughs> uh, you know what they what they like to drink. They yeah. appreciate when you have, you know, a, a certain bottle of wine on board, um, or a certain type of vodka, or a certain type of sandwich. Um, how do you guys take on that? I don't know if I want to call it salesmanship, but that customer interaction as opposed to the airlines. For me, it's it's always been, I'm a people person. I like talking to people. Uh, I've had interactions with people where uh, I actually have to stop talking because we need to get going. Uh, like we picked up these three guys who were, uh, what were they doing? They were fishing in nowhere, Wyoming. Uh, which is a whole nother thing. Some of the places we go are just bizarre. Um, the runway was longer than the town was around. <laughs> but it turns out one of the guys had built the citation. He used to work at the factory. One of the guys had been an F-15 pilot. The other guy had been an F-16 pilot. Oh, that went, that became hysterical. And I, I finally go, guys, I got to get you home. <laughs> so, um, I just try to interact with them uh, when I greet them at the, either as they walk out in the FBO or if they walk out and get out of their cars. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help them with the bags, where they went up front, what needs to go in the back, uh, make sure there's no, you know, where the batteries are. That's the big concern. They can't have those in the cargo compartment. Um, and, uh, but for me, it's not a big deal. You know, in flight, we don't tend to, uh, interact with them a whole lot. Uh, they can control the air conditioning on the on the lemon uh, from the VIP seat, uh, and I will show them how to do that. And they know where everything is for the most part. Um, but I also tell them, you know, if you have any questions or anything we can do for it, just come up and tap me on the shoulder. You know, I, I'll be spooked, but uh, it's funny because in the I'm not used to being able to hear the passengers, and it. In the in the lemon, it's even worse because it sounds like when they're talking in the back, it sounds like they're right behind you. <laughs> I keep on turning, looking over my shoulder. Somebody there. Um, so it's uh, it's a little. You don't get to know them so much as to, well, if you're like in my in your case, like my first company, I knew several of the owners, and you do you know you can you already know what catering is going to show up before they even get there, before you even see the trip sheet, you know what the catering is going to be. You know what they're going to need, uh, what their drink's going to be, what to have out for them. Uh, I remember one customer, we always had to have, um, uh, was it plain or peanut butter <laughs> M&Ms? We had to have them in the cups by receipt. Yeah. I can't remember which one it was. Um, oh, no, it was pretzels. Always had to make sure I had bags, bags of pretzels on the airplane for this one passenger. So, And you get to know them because you fly them around so much. Um, but for the, for yeah. the general customer, it's just, you know, um, I, you know, it's, I've always taken pride in how I look. So I'm trying to look professional. I'm trying to act professional. I want to put on a, you know, good show for them. I make sure, you know, if they want to take pictures, getting on the airplane, I volunteer to take the pictures yeah. or you know, that kind of stuff. Just, you know, just a little, just chit chat. And because, you know, they're still fearful flyers, even if they're paying big bucks for it, there's still people afraid to fly. Um, talk about the dogs, if they have them or the cats or whatever they have coming with them. Uh, so yeah, it's just, you know, idle chatter that, you know, you're just trying to be friendly. So. Yeah. How about you, Stephen? Do you, how do you take on that, that kind of interaction? You, you know, I, I generally greet everybody the same way. And I kind of go from there because a lot of the business guys just want to get in and, go and then there's some people that want to talk your off there's some that want nothing to do with you you know it's it's from a wide variety of people um but you know there's some that you know in some cases like you know jeff was talking about these road shows um i've had this one flight where we were actually doing a sales flight so like there was a it was some office company where it was their sales guy on board then all the eight other people were people they were selling to so it's like and the notes and everything it said please explain every detail of the aircraft where all the catering was at so at that point it was a little extra because first of all it was eight 
females that had never been on a private jet before. So after the eight different pictures we took <laughs> before we got out of the plane, <laughs> I, I, I did a complete like flight attendant safety briefing of the aircraft because they'd never mm-hmm. been on it. And then I, had, I showed them all the catering and everything. So that level of detail, then there's um, when you kind of have the same repeat person, I, I've had, I've only had like three, but the one of them is a pro golfer and he's actually a nervous flyer. And then he also was really funny about people hand, handling his luggage. Well, the first time I didn't know that. So I did things that he didn't really care for. The second time around, I was smart enough to be like, hey, would you like me to actually handle your golf clubs? Or, hey, this, that, or the other. And then, you know, I also pointed out, hey, we're going to be flying over this huge thunderstorm over the Gulf, taking you home this evening, just, you know, in case you look out, you'll see lightning and everything. So I, I tend to kind of read the audience a little bit before I go okay. down the path. But, like, if I, I'm up and they're up in the galley, well, I don't. That was that was on the challenger when we had a galley space and we could do that. <laughs> um, you know, interact with them or get them stuff and everything. Um, and then if they've got like little kids with them, I'll offer to help them up the yeah. stairs. The last thing I want to do is see a baby drop. I, I, yeah. I don't. Same thing with a dog. Like I don't think these people realize there's not like a railing on both sides of the staircase. Like the dog can fall off when it comes yeah. up or down. So and I, either I, side. I, even on either side, side. <laughs> yeah so I, I i try to help with that and then you know i'll I'll help with babies and luggage or whatever but again it's just really reading who, who you're flying and everything um and then in some cases you know jeff was talking about loading their bags and everything we fly certain people that have a um habit of nar- narcotic use and you have to verbally ask them hey do you have any on you and can you dispose of them if you do before you board the aircraft because we cannot transport your illicit drugs on board yeah so little things like that that you got to remember in the notes before you get going and you know I mean, my company is pretty good it's like they're a nervous flyer hey make sure you have this and if you don't have this you know it's you know just the details you got to really pay attention to before you open your mouth or do anything yeah, one of my favorite parts about my job, both in in ninety one and and on demand one thirty five, was uh, just help helping ladies, you know, older ladies with their purses, helping them up and down the stairs. And um, I've also found that they're they're really the the chattiest and and the nicest. They, are. And, <laughs> they really are. Hey, they're, man, they love they love a guy in uniform. But <laughs> and, I, I, and I, I'll tell you something else too. You also have to watch them because they will run off with all the stock on the aircraft. Oh yeah, they will empty oh, your galley, yeah. and Replant. they know and they know where the big plastic bags are in the closet, and they'll sit there while you're going along, just swipe it all in there, all the alcohol, all the soda cans, and then you you know you'll get to where you're going. It's like there was only one old lady. Where did everything go? <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, in uh, in ninety one, we we plan for that. We carry full size wine bottles and and vodka bottles, and and we just we keep a case in the back of the airplane, uh, in the inside the the pressure vessel. We we carry a case just because we know that three of those bottles are going to depart the airplane uh, when you land. <laughs> yeah, and you know that's another great thing about some passengers. They'll order these really expensive bottles of alcohol. And they won't touch them, then they'll leave them because they forget about them. Yeah. And that's the greatest tip ever is just taking those home with you. Oh, yeah. there's nothing better coming back from the trip and finding a handle of, you know, Johnny Walker or something <laughs> still in the drawer. Yep. It's like, yeah, okay, I'll take this home. <laughs> well, uh, what, one thing we've only got a, a few minutes to re- before we got to wrap up. And, <clears throat> and I want to wrap up with, with either, you know, a funny story or funny anecdote, you know, because it is all, it's, there, it's a blast flying this kind of flying. Um, what would you guys think is, if you want to say, your most absurd flight that you've done? Funny story or, or just an absurd story or, or funny moments in there? Uh, I think for me, I took uh, my first company. We had one jet that we managed for the owners. And they were great people. and. Uh, we were taking them down. It was uh, two couples. We were taking them down to vacation in Virginia someplace. And they had a lot of stuff. They had a box. And it was very heavy. And it was nothing but booze. It must have weighed, oh, 40, 50 pounds of just liquor. So um, we get everything offloaded. And they drive away. And my FO comes out. Jeff, they forgot 
a box and guess which box it is? It's all the booze. So fortunately I had his phone number. <laughs> uh, unfortunately the cell phone coverage in that part of Virginia isn't very good. It took me a while to get a hold of them, but they had to come back to the jet and this is the owner. So I'm, I'm rather humiliated that I've forgotten his liquor because uh, he and I had some history of me recommending a restaurant in uh, Aruba that I had been to. And he said he was going to go the next time he was down there. And I know that he went, but I never got to talk to him again about it. I was having honest about whether he liked it. Or he ended up doing it. But he, he was really cool about it. But it was just, a, yeah, I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to get fired over this one. <laughs> so, but he was really good about it. That's probably the funniest story I had. Um, yeah. What about you, Stephen? Um, so it, th this was like my second flight with the company picked up a bunch of, uh, four dealer owners in um, at the, uh, Lewisburg, Virginia by the Greenbrier resort. They had a convention or something, had a ton of bags. Like we maxed out the bag and the challenger, just going over to Detroit, get over to Detroit. I love in the bags. Everyone's taking their bags and there's two left. And we're like, hey, somebody left their bags. They're like, that's not ours. So we go through and we ask everybody, like, so these aren't your bags. And they're like, no, those aren't ours. So we had taken some, the, the, so like the company they had used had loaded up the bags they thought belonged to them and they brought them to the plane. And they're, <laughs> when we were there, we asked them, it was like, are all these yours? They're like, yes, they are. So we load them up, <laughs> we get there. And then I'm outside. I'm like, so this is nobody's bags. I'm like, yeah, those aren't ours. I go up, tell the captain, hey, we got two bags that don't belong to these people. And he's like, you serious? I was like, yep. So we spent the next 30 minutes trying to contact these people. And it's go home day for both of us. And he's got a flight in like an hour and a half. Oh. And it's an hour to the airport. Oh, so geez. like as we're in the car, I'm talking to these people. And then um, we figured it out. And we FedExed them back to the people. <laughs> it's just like you can't make this up like it's crazy i've had the opposite happen where a passenger took our cabin hostess's oh, computer no. bag computer oh, bag no. uh yeah that was uh, that took a day to figure out yeah yeah I, I i'll tell you one more i was picking up some people after the um old miss auburn game last year and uh, taking them back home to texas and i mean it they they had been drinking already, and they had a no. lot of booze on board. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> like they, they had a bottle of Don Julio, two six packs of beer, a fifth of vodka, and something else on top of what they had brought back from the game. Now, I, I know CG is a big deal in aircraft and everything, but I have never flown an aircraft where people dancing around, jumping around. It actually affects the pitch <laughs> of the <laughs> aircraft. <laughs> And disconnects the autopilot. It yes. is, it's just, I never would have thought that would happen. Welcome to the life of a small jet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah. uh, one story that I'll only give the, um, the what is it? The uh, the headline is we, one of our regular clients at, at my 135 that I last flew at was, was a sports celebrity i'm not going to say their names obviously but a sports celebrity that was married to a supermodel and she was a supermodel in the 90s um now you know a couple, couple of decades later they 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 look like a normal couple that you would find at at whole foods and and uh i took them on a four day trip and the the moment we landed they shared their phone numbers with me and just to you know give updates and i said hey well here's my phone number you know i was, I was pic so if, if your plans change we're not going anywhere we're here for you guys for the entire four days uh we'll be at we'll be at a hotel that's 20 minutes from here all we need is an hour's notice and, and we'll have you ready if your plans change um and this uh this supermodel this 90s supermodel when i put her phone number in, in my phone i actually screen captured it sent it to my wife and said you Bad would idea. not you would not believe whose phone number is is in my phone right now i am never getting rid of this phone um and even she was impressed because she was like oh okay i mean it's the funny things again that you don't get in the airlines or, or definitely not military aviation um and, and i'll just end with one one last thing which is tips tips are nice tips are nice tips, tips are nice
They don't yeah. always happen. They're few and far between, but uh, they are nice. Some they are. some are pretty impressive. Yeah, so. it is. Uh, it it is really nice to feel appreciated, to not feel like the help uh, when somebody hands you a tip at the end of a a good flight. And I think that kind of encompasses everything we've talked about here today. You know, the airplanes, the customer experience, the the ability to get them where they want to go efficiently, safely. Um, with that sort of customer and personal interaction. Um, and that, I think that culminates, um, occasionally when you get those, those really yeah. nice tips. Um, well, listen, we are, we are at our time and I want to thank both of you guys. I know it took to, to, to get three corporate pilots <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. to sit down for an hour and a half, uh, at the same time frame. It was, it took us a couple months to get here, but I really appreciate um, you guys taking your time to, uh, to help our listeners understand a little bit more about this corporate aviation side. So. I was, I was thrilled when you brought it up, Armando. I thought it was a great idea. I'm so. glad you said, yeah. Plus we all oh, love yeah. hearing your voice. So. <laughs> oh, well, so. yeah. And, and you, Steven, I think your, your journey has been really public right over yeah. the last yeah. Oh, yeah. Last, over the yeah. last couple of years where everybody's interested in learning about your journey. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. You know, and and we all, I think each each of the three of us represents probably a fraction of the listenership that is trying to do the same thing, whether it's coming up through general aviation to the airlines to corporate, trying to figure out what path they want to be on, or retiring from the military, figuring out what path they want to be on, or retiring from the airlines um, and explore both. Something new. <laughs> or both yeah. um, so hopefully somebody will take away something from this little conversation. Plus it's always just fun to talk about airplanes and yeah. No, no, we don't like talking about airplanes. <laughs> Give us honest. another couple hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a couple of beers. Oh, All Steve right, guys. And I, Steve and I could talk about the phenom here for the, like the next two hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, yeah. And, <laughs> by the, before you go, Steven, you're going to find the airplane flies a lot better than the sim. It's not okay, near it because that that uh, trying to roll the airplane so, so is not just, as bad. Just just you know, for those that don't know, Embraer products have a yoke that's like this. So instead the of holding it like this, you like this. And I knew that going into it. Didn't help. And like I work out a decent bit with my wife now, <laughs> but my arms were killing me each day <laughs> after the sim when I was can fly. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like it's just you're holding it up here, you know. Like, <laughs> well, we all have that in common because the hawkers got ram's horns also. Oh, does it? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, the phenom. The first time I went to turn the airplane, I thought the autopilot was on, and I was fighting to, to override the autopilot because it was so heavy and roll. I had never experienced wow. that before. That was that was definitely an eye opener. The airplane's uh, it still jumps off the ground when you take uh, off out of Teterboro on the Rudy Six. You're gonna have your hands full. Ah, uh, the Rudy Six. We could do an hour on that. The Rudy yeah, Six. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we, we could. could. So. Um, well, you know what? You brought up. I, I know we we got to cut it off, but uh, but no, we don't. We. <laughs> I want to know. We will live it here, but I want to know. When we've now flown a couple of jets. What is the one corporate jet that that each of you wants to fly? Uh, so I, I, I'm kind of split now because I've I've. I've flown a you know Bombardier business jet. I've flown. Well, I will be flying Embraer jet, but that legacy Praetor that Embraer makes oh. is just amazing. Like the it, interiors are amazing. The flight deck is amazing. When the when they tell you, yeah, the V one cut is you let go. That's it. You let go. It does it. Or if, if you go around, you let go. It does it. it, it it's kind of enticing because you want to experience it just the technology that's there and everything. But um, I, I'd, I'd like to fly a global or a Gulfstream just to have yeah. something big, you know, because I've actually have not flown an aircraft over 70, uh, 85,000 pounds gross weight. So I would like to fly something that's actually six, you know, six digits. Yeah. How about you, Jeff? Uh, avionics wise, the 10 wasn't that great. It was manageable. Uh, the lemon's got great avionics. Uh, this, the synthetic vision is just mind blowing. Uh, if I could take the HUD from the 7.3, three, 
the avionics from the, the lemon and put it all on a citation 10. Yes. The citation 10 was great because it had a it was a monster to fly as far as horsepower. It was like a big block Corvette. I mean, it would get up and go. And uh and it went fast. So no matter where you were going, you were getting there in a hurry. Uh, we could we could shave up to 45 minutes to almost an hour off a of transcon just because we were going, you know, 0.9 the whole way and everybody else is doing 0.8. Yeah. So, um, and it was a nice airplane to fly. It was very easy to fly. Um, so that would be my favorite of the ones that I've flown. The Falcon yeah. was, uh, it's French. I'm sorry. It's just wrong. It's like the Airbus. It's just wrong. Well, see, for me, that that's mine. I want to fly a, a Falcon 7X. The, now, I must say, I agree with Stephen, though. The, I got to look inside a Prater and talk to the crew uh, last trip. And I, I, I apologize for the drool spot I left on the carpet outside of the <laughs> cockpit. Just looking in the cockpit, how big it was. And instead of that little shoehorn that Stephen and I have to climb into. <laughs> it's <laughs> Neither one of us is very big, and it's tiny. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's great. I love I love hearing Pip talk about that when he transitioned to the Phenom. Oh, the lemon. That was yeah, yeah. that was fun to listen to those stories. And I go, that's what I'm gonna be flying. Oh, great. <laughs> I, I go, yeah. I gotta, but I'm thinking I'm gonna have an espresso machine. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all great airplanes. Well, yeah. again, thanks guys. Uh I want to appreciate your your time and 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 your stories. And uh, hopefully we'll get some feedback if the listeners have any questions anything that we've uh oh yeah your interest in any of this i think all of us are willing to answer any questions and um whether it's uh sending it over to to apg or us at ptuk i think we can all get a hold of of the three of us um, whichever avenue uh, you you are listening okay. to this on yep and armand if you ever want to do this again i'm game okay sounds yeah. good thanks for having me thanks guys yeah thank you take care all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Well, that was great. And I feel like we could have just gone on for another couple hours. As the guy said, I really want to thank Jeff and Stephen for joining me. Uh, and again, just talking about this really unique part of aviation. Um, if you have any questions at all whatsoever, send them to the show, send them to us, send them to APG. Uh, they know how to get a hold of all of us. And especially if you're interested in coming into this portion of aviation, now that there's so many people getting their pilot's licenses, getting their certifications, and it, it's just a great alternate career avenue if you're interested about learning about it, just just come to us. But again, thank you to those guys, and uh, actually thank you to Pip. Pip was trying to make some time, but he had a, a trip that he had to do, go on. Um, would have been great to get the European aspect of business aviation and corporate aviation. Um, either way, we'll see you guys next week if you are... Uh, looking to get a hold of us you can go through facebook twitter instagram just search for plane talking uk you can always uh, use whatsapp to get a hold of us even during the show or or uh, throughout the week send us some pictures send us some content you can even send us audio files through there audio feedback that's plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six you can email us at podcast at plane talking uk.com or just go to the website plane talking uk.com and again, if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get notifications when we go live and you can actually help shape the conversation of the show by joining us in the chat room, which is the best part of the show. Um, plus, the chat room actually just kind of keeps us straight uh, and above that 51% accuracy rating, as uh, Captain Jeff likes to say. Um, you could always use our Amazon link to uh, help support the show. I promise we don't see what, you, what you're buying. Or you can always become a Patreon. We couldn't show... Uh, we couldn't put on this show without our Patreon supporters and our uh, PayPal supporters. So again, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any ideas for another special that you'd like to see, uh, just let us know, and we'll see you guys next week. Uh -huh.